some of you may have heard of this psalm before. Um, it's a reasonably well-known one, known one, a reasonably popular one. Um, so you might sort of think, well, why are we looking at uh, Psalm 23? Um, well, I think there's a lot of lessons in there and particularly a lot of encouragements in there for us um, at all times of our lives. But I think especially at this current time, as we continue, even though things are improving and things are starting to open up, we still, the world still faces a lot of uncertainty. Um, and I think that this psalm, a uh, psalm that is accredited to David, um, has a lot to encourage us um, this morning. And I don't know about you, um, but I know that I am needing a little bit of encouragement. Um, the last, I would say, from the time that I was in uh, Munich in March, when I was waiting at uh, Trudering Station for John and Lucy to come and pick me up uh, for a meeting, and then John arrived with a very concerned uh, and disturbed look on his face. And he said to me, Lucy's brother has passed away back in the States. We're going to have to leave as soon as we can. It was a really, really shocking moment. Um, and even though I don't know John and Lucy that well, um, I felt it deep in my heart, just the pain that they would be going through, the uncertainty that they would be going through, all of those questions of why, why did this happen? Why did it happen? to us why did it happen to him but ever since that time up until now uh Connie and i have actually experienced a lot of um i guess really challenging things um a friend of mine in the states a very very good friend of mine we've been friends probably for about 20 years um within the space of three days he lost both of his parents to the coronavirus um, his, his mother died first and, and he sent me a message to say that she had passed away uh, and then two days later uh, I got another message for him saying that his father had passed away um, as well and I felt such sorrow for him such pain for what he was going through and also that that real sense of um, I guess powerlessness that I could not be there with him that I could not bring some sort of consolation and then last week, a very, very good friend of mine um, who I knew when I was living in Hong Kong, he lived in Singapore, we were very, very good friends. Um, he died of cancer uh, and a friend, a mutual friend of ours sent me a text telling me that he had passed away um, after a battle, a fairly short battle with um, kidney cancer. And then recently, Actually, very, very recently, just yesterday, we received a message, Kwani received a message from uh, one of our ex congreg well, a member of the congregation that we were previously at. Um, and her husband had become very, very sick. Uh, he, they discovered that he had cancer of the pancreas. And uh, we exchanged a whole bunch of messages and we were hoping to get down, Kwani was hoping to get down to the hospital yesterday to spend some time with her. Um, and then she texted later in the afternoon and said, it's too late. He has already passed away. Now, many people are going through difficulties. This is a time of, of upheaval um, in Germany, in Australia, in the US. Uh, it doesn't matter. Some countries are, are, are less touched by it. But it's not only the loss of life, but it's the loss of income. It's uh, having to have our kids at home uh, and not being able to go to work. And we've got to work from home and we've got to look after the kids and we've somehow got to do shopping. Um, and, and life is difficult. It's really, really challenging. And it's in these times of upheaval and in these times of crisis that we really need God the most. We need a sense of his presence. We want to hear his voice, his comfort, his clear direction. It's in these times though, it's in those difficult times that we usually find it most difficult to sense those things, to sense God, to sense his presence, to hear his voice or to feel him. So today we come and we look at a Psalm that to most of us uh, is a very, very familiar Psalm. We've grown up with it in church. We've sung, sung songs about it. Uh, most of us, or a large portion of us, could probably recite most of it, if not all of it, 
uh, quite easily. But there's one potential negative when we know something too well, is we've become so familiar with it that it can sometimes lose its impact upon us. And so for those things that we're most familiar with, sometimes it's really good for us to go back and to examine it again and to open our hearts and to open our minds again and say, God, what are you saying in here? What are you saying to me? What are you saying to your people? What are you saying to this world? So we have this beautiful Psalm, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, or I shall not lack for anything. I used to always find that was really strange when I was a kid to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. To me, that meant the Lord is my shepherd, but I don't want him. Um, so it took me a long time to actually understand what that was, uh, what that was all about. Um, but the Lord is our shepherd. And because he's our shepherd, we shall not lack anything. So there are several images in this short group of verses. And this morning, I just want to look at two particular images. The first is the Lord as shepherd, and the second is the Lord as our friend. So firstly, the Lord as shepherd. Let me just read verses 1 through 4 again. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk in the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So this idea of God as a shepherd is something that we do see throughout Scripture. We see God referred to as the shepherd of his people, the shepherd of his people Israel. The first time we see it is actually in the book of Genesis, where Moses calls the Lord the shepherd. He says that you are the shepherd, the rock of Israel, is in Genesis 49, verse 24. The first time we hear this imagery uh, of God as the shepherd. Now, David, who is ascribed this Psalm 23, he knew this metaphor in a unique way having been a shepherd himself. If you know the story of David, when he was young, when Samuel came to anoint um, one of Jesse's sons as king, um, all of these great, big, burly, fantastic sons were there, and Je uh, Samuel looked at all of them and said, none of these are going to be anointed king. God has not chosen any of these. Do you have another son? And they said, yep, we've got this little guy called David. Uh, he's a little scrawny guy, and he's out tending the sheep. So David was, he knew what it meant to be a shepherd. So he uses a metaphor here, or he uses this imagery here, something that he's intimately aware of. He knows what it's like to be a shepherd. And instead of saying, the Lord is my king, the Lord is my conqueror, the Lord is my defender, which he does in many other places in the Psalms. But here he chooses to say, the Lord is my shepherd. A shepherd lives with their flock, particularly in ancient times. Wherever the sheep went, the shepherd went with them, and he would sleep with them, and he would eat with them, and he would spend time. Sometimes they would be out for days or weeks at a time as they searched for food for the sheep. And the shepherd lives with the sheep. He tends it, he protects the flock, he guides the flock. He is its protector. He is its carer. If we wind forward or move forward to the New Testament, we see Jesus use this metaphor of himself as well. Now, the interesting thing that we see with Jesus calling himself the shepherd is that by the time of uh, Jesus' life, Shepherds were actually viewed, they, they were considered some of the lowest people in society. Uh, if you look at some extra biblical materials from the time, uh, one commentator or one author says that shepherds are all thieves. Uh, because, and quite often they were, because they earned very, very little money. Quite often they just earned some food to eat. So what they would do is that they would break into people's homes and they would steal things. 
So shepherds were not seen as something to be looked up towards. And here comes Jesus saying, I am the shepherd. And so it's very interesting that he uses this imagery. So I just want to read to you from John chapter 10, where Jesus uses this imagery of himself. And this is really powerful, and it will help us to understand a little bit more of what this imagery of shepherd means, of what David is meaning. So I'm going to be reading from John chapter 10, verses 1 to 15. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep do not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. So Jesus takes this image of the shepherd and he calls himself the good shepherd. Uh, it's almost like he, well I'm not saying it's almost like, he understands that the imagery of the shepherd is not that great, that their reputation is not that fantastic. And he talks about why it's not that fantastic, because when the wolf comes or when these other threats come, because they don't own the sheep, they're just a hired hand, they will run away. But Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. How a shepherd would look after the sheep at night is generally they would bring them back in from the fields and they would put them into a little compound. It might just be like a, a low stone wall, maybe up to waist high or a little bit higher. And in one section of that wall, there would be a gate. Now, usually there would not be anything across it. And what would happen is that the shepherd, once he's brought the sheep in for the night, and he's got them in this little compound, then what he would do is he would sit in the gate. He was the gatekeeper. He would sit in the gate, and that is where he would sleep. And that is how he would keep the sheep safe. So they wouldn't go out because he was sitting in that gate area. But also then if thieves came in and they wanted to steal the sheep, he would hear them and then he would get up and scare them away. And so Jesus in this passage says, I'm the gate, I'm the gatekeeper, and I'm the shepherd. I am all of these things. I am the good shepherd. So it's not only in the Old Testament do we see this imagery of God as the shepherd. We see in the New Testament, Jesus also saying, I am the shepherd. I am the good shepherd. I am the protector. I am the one who will defend. I am the one who will be there to look after you. I will tend the sheep. I will keep them safe. And in the second part, if we look at verse 4 of Psalm 23, it says, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It seems like a bit of a strange statement. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Whenever I, particularly when I was younger, whenever I thought of a rod or a staff, I thought of discipline. I thought of getting a smack. Um, my, my parents, and you know, um, I have permission to say this, um, but they used to smack 
my eldest sister and I with a wooden spoon. So they didn't have a rod or a staff or a belt, um, but it was a wooden spoon that you cooked with. Um, and that was sort of used as the threat um, to, you know, pa uh, parenting experts at that stage were saying you should never hit your child with your hand. You should always use something so that they don't think that you're hitting them, but you're being hit by an instrument. Uh, now, of course, the world has changed since then. Um, but that was the rod for us, the rod of discipline. And we always feared that. But here, David is not talking about something of fear. The rod in Hebrew, the term here is shavet or shavet. And the shepherd's rod, what they did is they used it for many things. They used it to count the sheep. Uh, they used it to discipline the sheep. Uh, but they also used it as a way to protect the sheep. If other animals, if wolves or bears or whatever was around during that time, it came to attack the sheep, they, they would use their rod to fend off these other animals. So throughout the Old Testament, we see the rod being associated with protection, with discipline, uh, and also with punishment. Um, we see in, in Isaiah chapter 10 that God says that Assyria, or sorry, that the prophet says that Assyria was God's rod of anger against the Israelites. And the staff, it's interesting we see these two different things here, the rod and the staff. Um, the staff was seen, the king would hold a staff. It was an, it was an, an, an instrument of rule, an instrument of justice or the scepter of justice. So we see the shepherd as the protector and the carer, but we also see the shepherd as the, as the one who brings discipline, the one who has authority, and the one who will bring justice to the sheep. And the sheep need this protector. I think that David and also Jesus intentionally for many reasons intentionally use this imagery of the shepherd and the sheep aristotle said this about sheep that sheep are foolish sluggish creatures most likely of any creature to wander even though it has no need and least likely to ever return a sheep can make no shift to save itself from tempest or inundation there it stands and will perish if not driven or protected by the shepherd. People joke about sheep being some of the dumbest of animals. I'm not sure if that's actually true. But in this imagery, I think that God used sheep as for a particular reason. We need a shepherd. Sheep need a shepherd. They don't have a way to defend themselves. They don't have sharp teeth. They're not very fast. I don't know if you've ever been to a sheep farm. I've been on many sheep farms in my life, strangely enough. And sheep have no way to defend themselves. They need the shepherd. They need the farmer. They, rel they are reliant and dependent upon the shepherd for protection. Without him, they are completely vulnerable. So overwhelmingly, the idea behind David using God as a shepherd or referring to him as this shepherd, the overwhelming message he's trying to bring is one of care and concern, of protection. So David found comfort in using this language. <clears throat> Excuse me. He found comfort in using the language of the Lord is my shepherd. He loves me. He protects me, he comforts me, he cares for me, he disciplines me, just like a shepherd does for its own sheep. And the second image that we see, as I said before, we look at two images that we see here in Psalm 23. The second is that image of the Lord as, or God as friend. Let me read from verse 5 of, chapter, of um, Psalm 23. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. You prepare a table before me. This is real intimate image here. Uh, one of the other key areas that we see this imagery is in the book of Song of Solomon. 
or Song of Songs, as you may know it. Uh, now, I'm not going to go and read through that, but you can read it at another time. In Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, we see this imagery of the lover asking his beloved to come in and to come into the banqueting table. And you may know this term, and it says, and his banner over me is love. Now, when we were young, we used to sing this song. He brought me to his banqueting table and his banner over me is love. And this comes directly from Song of Solomon. And it's a very intimate imagery. And here we see this of David saying that God prepares a table before us. He prepares a place of welcome. He prepares a place of friendship. He prepares a place of intimacy, of relationship, even in the midst of our enemies, even in the midst of our trials and our difficulties and our storms. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is intimate language. This is personal relational language here. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies and you anoint my head with oil. Now, some of you may be familiar with the story in Luke chapter 7, when Jesus goes to Simon the Pharisee's house for a meal. And the woman comes with the alabaster flask of oil and she pours the oil on his feet and then she wipes his feet with her hair. You may be familiar with that story. And Simon the Pharisee starts to judge her. And Jesus can see and knows what Simon is thinking. And Simon is thinking, if this man was a prophet, if he was truly God, he would know who this woman is and he wouldn't let her touch him. And so then Jesus challenges Simon and challenges him on the love that this person has shown. And one of the challenges he says, and one of the ways that I guess you could say he convicts Simon, he says, when I arrived, you did not give me oil for my head and you did not give me water for my feet. Now, this was a sign of welcome when someone came to your home. People lived in, you know, there was no bitumen, there was no asphalt on the roads at that time. It was just dirt and people wore sandals. They didn't wear Doc Martens or Nikes or anything like that. So when you came in at the end of the day, your feet were just disgustingly dirty. So if somebody invited you to their home, they would have a bowl of water there. And when you came in, you would wash your hands and you would wash your feet. And then, particularly if the person was of good means, if they were reasonably wealthy, they would have a small flask of oil and they would pour it onto your head as a sign of welcome. So again, we're not... David is not using imagery here of like some Holy Spirit anointing. We see this is friendship. You prepare a table before me. You invite me to come in and to eat with you. And as part of that, you pour water on my head, uh, sorry, oil on my head, the oil of welcome, the oil of friendship. And another thing that gives away this imagery of friendship is when he goes on, <coughs> excuse me, in verse 6, he says, Surely goodness and mercy, some translations will say goodness and love shall follow me. The literal translation of that word follow, many other, many other, many other English translations will translate it as pursue. And that's actually a more accurate translation of this term. Goodness and love will pursue me. It will pursue us like a lover pursues the one that they're interested in. Now, I would love to make a joke about how Kwani pursued me, um, but probably it was more me pursuing her. But when we are interested in someone, we want to know more about them. We ask other friends, do you know about this person? Are they seeing anyone? Are they interested in anyone? What sort of things do they like? What sort of music do they like? What do they like to do? We start pursuing, we start doing research because we're really interested in that person. And that is the sort of imagery that we've got here. This is the imagery that David gives us. That surely goodness and mercy will pursue us, will chase after us. God will pursue us. He'll welcome us into the table. He'll put the oil of friendship on our head and he will pursue us to pour out his love and his mercy on us all the days of our lives. 
So the Lord we see here, these two, image, these two images of the shepherd, the protector, the carer. And we see the Lord as the friend who invites us in to a banqueting table, even in the presence of our enemies, even in the midst of our struggles. He says, come, come in and be safe. And he welcomes us. This is really beautiful language. And some people might find it a little bit uncomfortable. I don't know. I don't know how you feel. Do you feel it's easy to say, I love God. I love Jesus. Do you find it easy to sing worship songs that express love and emotion and affection that you would think, well, I'm, I'm only sort of really used to sharing that with a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend or, or a family member. This is very, very intimate language and we're not all necessarily comfortable with it. But rather than focus on whether we're comfortable with it or not, I want to sort of head towards the finish line here with looking at why David might have felt this way or how did David get to a place of feeling this way about God. David trusted God. Even though he walks through the valley of the shadow of death, he will fear no evil. He will invite me in and prepare a banquet table in the presence of my enemies. He trusted God. Why did he trust? How did he come to this place of trust? So give you a bit of an image here, a bit of an illustration. If one of your family members, if one of your closest family members or one of your best friends said to you, look, you just need to trust me. And then I came along to you and you guys don't know me very well. And I said to you the same thing. Look, you just need to trust me. Who are you more likely to trust? Most of you will trust your family member or you'll trust your friend. And why? Is it because I'm this really bad person or I, I look untrustworthy? Maybe with my, my, my beard and my long hair at the moment, I do look a little untrustworthy, I don't know. But no, you'll, you'll trust your family members, you'll trust your friends because you know them. Your trust is built upon knowledge, it's built upon intimacy. It's built upon years of relationships of disappointments, of victory, of great times, of not so great times, but in essence, you've built up a trust in them and a love for them. So David was able to trust God, but how did he come to this place of being able to trust? I'm going to read you a few Psalms that will hopefully give us a bit of insight in how David came to the place of trusting God so much. Psalm verse, chapter 1, verses 1 to 2 says, Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law or in the word of the Lord. And on his, in his law they meditate day and night. Psalm 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all day long. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is always with me. Psalm 119, verses 105 to 107. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it. To observe your righteous ordinances or your righteous laws, I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. And then Psalm 9, verse 10. Those who know your name trust in you because you have not abandoned those who seek you. The way that David, the reason why David trusted God was because he knew him. And how did he come to know him? Yes, through the things that he experienced in his life with him. But what we see through David in the Psalms is that he spent time meditating on the word of God, which to him at that time was mostly the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. 
and then several other books as well. But David had come to trust God, had come to know God and built up trust by reading his word. He had built that personal understanding and knowledge. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 that he counts everything as loss so that he might know the word of God and that he might know God and the power of his resurrection. John chapter 17, and this is eternal life, that they know you. This is Jesus praying. He's praying for the disciples and praying for the believers. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. To know God, to know Christ, builds that trust in us so that when we are in difficult times like we're in right now, we can pray as David prayed and say that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Even though I walk through the valley of the shepherd, shadow of death, even though I go through the time of coronavirus, even though I've lost my job, even though I've lost family members or I've lost friends, I will fear no evil. Because these things will come. David doesn't say these things won't come if we believe in God. But what we see in David is this ongoing trust. A trust in God even in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death. Even in the midst of his enemies, he trusts in God. I read a really, really interesting story when I was uh, researching this message. And it tells the story of um, a church. And I think the pastor was asking people if they could remember and if they could recite the 23rd Psalm. And a 10-year-old boy puts up his hand. And the pastor says, come to the front, come to the front. And he goes up there and he recites the whole thing. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And, you know, he's a 10-year-old boy, he's cute, and everyone's like, oh, it's so fantastic, isn't that great? He's memorized the psalm. And then an 80-year-old woman put her hand up. And the pastor said, come up here. And she went up and she recited the psalm. And it wasn't cute. But as people listened to this woman, and she was known to most of the people in the church, and as she recited the psalm, people looked at this person who was 80 years old, who had been through life, had walked difficult paths. And as she read that psalm, she read it in, a, in the way, like a woman who knew the shepherd in the passage. And people started to cry and people were quiet. You see, the boy knew Psalm 23. The woman knew the shepherd in Psalm 23. As we walk through life, and the trials, the failures, the victories, the mountaintop experiences, the coronaviruses, the, the various, the stock market crashes, the recessions, all of these sort of things. Will we just know the scriptures or will we really know the shepherd? Will we, will we really know the God behind those scriptures? Will we be able to say at the end of our lives that he is our shepherd and that we haven't lacked for anything? That even though we've walked through the valley of the shadow of death, we haven't needed to fear any evil because his rod and his staff has comforted us. He has prepared a table before us in the presence of our enemies. He anoints my head with oil, my cup overflows, and surely goodness and mercy has followed me all the days of my life. And when this life is over, I will dwell in the house of the Lord. And I will dwell in the house 
during my life as well in the house of the Lord. I want to encourage each one of us, and I need to encourage myself with this. Uh, please, I, I have to tell you, these last few weeks, um, actually since I came back from Germany, they've been really, really challenging. Uh, we're living in a house uh, where we're sleeping on the floor at the moment. We have no furniture. Um, <laughs> we uh, don't know whether we're going to be able to get on the plane Thursday night. Um, we've got two young children and one child, that uh, four-year-old, that's climbing the walls. Um, I've had to keep doing my job, and Kwani's had to keep doing her job. Um, there's just been so much going on. We've lost friends, we've lost family members. Uh, we've known people that have lost family no, Sorry, we haven't lost family members. We've known people that have lost family members. It's been a really difficult time. And during that time, what I've been trying to do is when I wake up in the morning and my first tendency or temptation is to go and to check the news and to see what sensational news there is. What I've been trying to do is to resist that temptation and instead to go to the Word, to go to God. Because the news is going to change every day. Sometimes it's going to be bad news, sometimes it's going to be good news. Sometimes it's going to be bad, it's going to be worse news. But God never changes. And we need to find our rest in Him so that when we face the challenges of the world that we're in at the moment, we can have trust in Him. We can say that even though all of these things are going on, even though it seems like everything is falling apart, he is my shepherd. And because I know him, I trust him. The word of God is a great place to go during these times of difficulty. To understand God more to understand his love, to experience his love, and to build our trust and faith in him so that no matter what happens tomorrow, we know that God is with us, that he's the shepherd. He is there in the gate. We're in, we're in the compound. We are one of his sheep, but he's there in the gate and he's not asleep. He's watching over us. He's loving us. He's protecting us. He's disciplining us. He's building us and strengthening us. May we cultivate hearts of thankfulness during this time. May we see the silver lining in the gray cloud. May we be able to pray Psalm 23 or read Psalm 23 in the same spirit that David wrote it, in the spirit of trust. A trust that is built upon relationship. A trust that is built upon really knowing God. Let's pray. Lord God, I have said many words today and I, I pray that those words have been from you. I pray that your Holy Spirit is speaking, not me. Father, I pray for each one of us. I pray that we would know you in the way that you want us to know you. That we would know you through your word, that we would know you through prayer, that we would know you through your activity and your action in our lives. And may that knowledge build trust in our hearts so that when we face Challenges like we are facing now, because this will not be the only challenge that we face in the rest of our lives. There will be many, many challenges. But may we know you to the point of really trusting in you. So that we can say with the psalmist, that we can say with David, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil because you are with us, that you comfort us, you bless us, you guide us. Help us to know you more. Open your word, open our eyes to see you, open our hearts to know you, open our minds to understand 
to understand and to know you as our shepherd and as our friend. In Jesus' name, amen.